Okay, church, for those who are visiting us for the first time, we've made it to the end of our sermon series, which many of you have said has been so convicting going through the book of James. And the sermon series was titled, Does Anyone Need Wisdom? Lessons from the book of James. And man, guys, what a sermon series it has been. We've repeated this phrase throughout the series that James gets all up in our business while in the same time acknowledging that this is all motivated by God's love for us and out of the depths of James' pastoral heart for Christ's church. And the lessons of wisdom for us from James as disciples of Christ has been transformational. He's provided us with a clear, practical, action-oriented blueprint for how we mature as Christians and how we live out our faith in Christ. The wisdom of James chapter 1 taught us, consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds because the testing of our faith produces perseverance. James implores us to be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. The wisdom of James chapter 2 taught us never show favoritism. And that faith without works, it's dead. The wisdom of James chapter 3 taught us to tame our tongues. And he talks about that message a lot throughout the book. The wisdom of James chapter 4 taught us that God opposes the proud and favors the humble. And the wisdom of James chapter 5 taught us that God, excuse me, that giving is the antidote to materialism and to be patient. We pick up the story this morning in the closing verses of James chapter 5 where he will conclude his letter with another profound lesson of wisdom, which is this. Pray all the time. Say it with me. Pray all the time. But before we read the text together, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for the revelation of your holy word. We pray by your power that we wouldn't merely listen to your word, but do what it says. We're so grateful for the power of prayer. Amen. Okay, saints, so we're going to read uh, James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. You can view it on the screen. You could read it in your bulletin, the Bible in your pew, the Bible on your phone, wherever you can find the word. James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. 
So saints, throughout this book, James has addressed the fact that as Christians, we have divided hearts. Divided hearts meaning we serve two belief systems, the way of the world and the way of the kingdom of God. As human beings, there's a part of us that desires what God desires, but also there's a part of us that's self-seeking. So out of his pastoral wisdom, he ends the letter to the church by offering us an essential lesson about how our lives can remain God-centered by praying all the time. James encourages us to pray when we're suffering. James says, pray songs of praise when you're in a cheerful place. James instructs us to call on the elders of the church to pray and anoint us with oil when we're sick. Oil was used for several purposes in biblical times, including medicinal purposes. The parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke's gospel is a really good example for us. Jesus describes a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho who was attacked by robbers. The robbers stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and left the man there half dead. Luke chapter 10 verse 34 says this after that happened. It says, the good Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. Oil was also a symbol of God's spirit. We see this clearly when Samuel anoints David in 1 Samuel 16. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one, speaking of David. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I'm convinced, church, that James instructs us to use oil in the name of Jesus when we pray because it represents both the physical and spiritual healing we need on this side of eternity. And it's a great reminder for us this morning, in my opinion, of the power of Jesus, that he is both Lord over the body and Lord over our spirit. Let me unpack this important point a little more. When Jesus heard Martha and Mary crying out to heal their brother Lazarus, who had died, after praying to his father, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And what happened to Lazarus? He came out. He rose from the dead and miraculously, Lazarus was completely healed. But what about when God doesn't heal and answer the prayer of the faithful? Good question for us to ask this morning, isn't it? Here's what I think. With conviction, I believe Jesus can heal our physical ailments, but I also believe he may let his glory be displayed through our weaknesses too. Church, this is a game changer. He did exactly this through the Apostle Paul when Paul was given a thorn in his side that never went away. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 that three times Paul pleaded, he prayed to the Lord to remove it, but this is what God said to him in response. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Saints, the wisdom of James is that the power of prayer is for both physical and spiritual healing in our sanctification process here on earth. A remarkable reality for all of us in Christ. Because what this means for us is whether we're in a physical battle with something like chronic pain or a spiritual battle with something like worry, God is always with us in all of it. And so we live as people of hope because one day we will be fully restored. We will be fully sanctified. And so we cling to the promise of the words in Revelation 21.4. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. Church, there's such hope in Christ. And Jesus came for the hearts of mankind. He came for your heart. He came to die on the cross so we could be forgiven for our sins. It's exactly why James remind us that as Christians we are not to do life on our own. James says that healing comes through the confession of our sins. And so he says, confess and pray for one another. I'm a huge believer in accountability partners. You know those people in your life who actually love you enough to tell you the truth <laughs> in a gracious and gentle way. It's easy to find people in the world who can co-sign things that aren't great. But we give thanks for those who look to us and say, there's a better way for you to imitate the way who is Jesus. And guys, if you're a part of the body of Christ here in the sanctuary or on the live stream, there is absolutely no reason not to have these relationships because God has provided his church body as a beautiful means of grace and truth in our lives. And here's the thing. I want to make this as plain as I can this morning. And I know if there was any other pastor, hopefully, in the world, they'd come up here and say the same thing. And if there's one takeaway you get from the sermon this morning, I hope it's this. One of the Christians' most powerful resources is communion with God through prayer. One of the Christian's most powerful resources is communion with God through prayer. It's everything. And the results, beyond our wildest dreams. That's why prayer should never be a last resort. It should always be a first response. Why? Well, because God's power is infinitely greater than ours. So it only makes sense to rely on it, especially because all God wants is for us, his children, to depend on him. I mean, my daughter just turned six last weekend, and she's doing the, oh, I got it, Daddy. I, I can do it on my own. And I'm like, no, you can't. Because <laughs> any father just wants his kids to depend upon him. And that's all the Father in heaven wants from us. You know that thirst you get after a really long run 
in a good New England summer in August, or maybe you go on one of those long walks and the sun is beating and you're just sweating. There's only one thing that can quench your thirst. It's some form of water. The same is true with prayer for our soul. When the soul is thirsty, the only thing that can quench it is Jesus. Because he is the bread of life. He's the living water. And prayer is what leads us to him. We use this quote from Henry Nouwen's book, Out of Solitude, at our last leadership retreat for elders and deacons. It's worth repeating because it's so applicable for today's text. Nouwen shares what he believes is the hidden mystery of Jesus' ministry. Here's what he writes. In the midst of a busy schedule of activities, healing suffering people, casting out devils, responding to impatient disciples, traveling from town to town, and preaching from synagogue to synagogue, we find these quiet words. In the morning, long before dawn, Jesus got up and left the house. He went off to a lonely place and he prayed. Now and says, the more I read this nearly silent sentence locked in between the loud words of action, the more I have the sense that the secret of Jesus' ministry is hidden in that lonely place where he went to pray early in the morning, long before dawn. In the lonely place, Jesus finds the courage to follow God's will and not his own. To speak God's words and not his own. To do God's work and not his own. It's in that lonely place where Jesus enters into intimacy with the Father and his ministry is born. End quote. Saints, if Jesus prayed all the time in the midst of all the busyness of ministry as the Son of God, (laughs) how much more do we need to pray also? In the final verses of James chapter 5, he encourages us that Elijah was a human being just like us. In other words, he was a sinner in need of grace. What James is emphasizing here is that he was a man who completely believed in the power of prayer. Elijah prayed for no rain. It stopped for three years. He prayed again. The rain came. All James says is that he prayed earnestly. So I looked up the definition for the word earnest, and I loved it. So I'm going to share it. Showing sincere and intense conviction. Showing sincere and intense conviction. What what does that mean? God's not looking for perfect words from us. He's not assessing our gifts He's not counting the resources we have. God just wants our genuine hearts, our faithful and diligent prayers. And prayers are vital when a brother or sister in Christ wanders from the church. And when that happens, Jesus tells us, go. <laughs> Go leave the 99 and get the one. And if you've ever strayed away and found yourself engulfed in sin and someone out of love pursues you and brings you back, it etches a special place in your heart forever. 
Because God's love is powerful. So when someone walks away from the faith, remember what Paul said about love. Really important. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. I need to hear that all the time. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And you know, church, in 2023, there's so many ways to reach out to the lost sheep. A text, phone call, FaceTime, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I think there's something called Be Real. My students here, Be Real. Sorry, guys, they hate when I do that. But yeah, Be Real. One of the coffee shops in towns, the list goes on. And God rewards those who pursues the lost. In verse 20, he says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. That's a promise. Okay, church, let me finish. The day God called Pastor Greg back to NPC, he made it so clear to all of us that prayer would be the engine for all things ministry here at Neroten. Not once did we waver from this biblical conviction as a congregation. So I want to infuse you, the church, the saints of Neroten, with some encouragement this morning. I am convinced that your devotion to prayer has been the primary reason why so many who walk into this church say they have experienced the love of God. We are committed to praying all the time because we know that we can't do anything for God (laughs) without God. But with God, all Things are possible. So when we run into someone in town and they ask for prayer, we pray for them right then and there. (laughs) you got to love the reaction of someone that's not used to that, right? Hey, Pastor Gary, uh, somewhere in Starbucks, Post Road, i got a prayer request. Sure, what is it? It's going through some. Hey, can I pray for you? Yeah, right now. Really? Yeah, really. When a prayer concern comes in via email, think about this. We pray for them every Wednesday night at our 11 a.m. staff meeting, Wednesday morning. The elders that lead this church pray for them at our session meetings. The prayer team of this church prays for them again at 6 o'clock. We pray for them during worship services, after worship services. We put the prayer concerns in the prayer wall, etc. I can go on and on. It's just so moving to know that we're a church committed to prayer. It's been astounding and humbling to watch the Holy Spirit transform lives, strengthen hearts, heal souls, since we've made prayer the priority of the church. And as pastors, we know that this action-oriented framework in Christ's church is so pleasing to our Father in heaven. And so this reminds me of a story about one of my favorite preachers, Charles Spurgeon. He was the 19th century pastor of the New York Park Street Chapel in London, England. A group of young ministers called on him one day for a tour of the church that he served as pastor. After showing them the large sanctuary, Spurgeon offered to show them the boiler room. 
The guests declined, but the pastor insisted. Spurgeon led them to the basement where they discovered about a hundred people in prayer. Sounds a lot like Wednesday night to me, guys. This, Spurgeon said with a huge smile, this is the boiler room. Whenever Spurgeon was asked about the secret of his ministry, he replied, my people pray. (laughs) The thought occurred to me, wouldn't it be wonderful if every church had a boiler room? A place in the building where people would seek the will of God? Nothing warms a preacher's heart more than to have a faithful member say, I want you to know, I pray. (laughs) NPC, we have several boiler rooms in our church. We pray. We pray. We pray all the time. And it's all for the glory of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well done, good and faithful servants.